Dr. Jennifer McIntosh. She is a professor and UA Distinguished Scholar in Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences at U of A. She does a lot of exciting research. Uh, we've had the great good fortune of working together before. And so uh, she's going to talk to us about groundwater this evening. Please welcome Dr. Jennifer McIntosh. Great. Thank you, Shepard. And I want to thank um, everyone for coming out tonight, especially the public. It's so nice to see so many new faces. And thank the students and faculty that are in the back of the room. Thanks for coming out tonight. In my department, when it pours, that's a cause for celebration. So I'm super excited that we've gotten some rain this fall, um, which, like Shipper said, is hopefully recharging groundwater. And I applaud you for coming out tonight to learn more about groundwater, which is such an important topic, especially for our region and for our state. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. This science cafe has a specific theme, and that's highlighting women in science. So not only current faculty in the College of Science at the university, but also thinking about past female scientists that maybe um, didn't get the credit that they deserved. So that's actually where I'm going to start today. And I'm just going to briefly highlight one of my favorite female scientists from history, which many of you, I'm sure, know, and that's Madame Murray Curry. Um, I had the fortune of getting to see her grave um, when I graduated from high school and went on a tour of Europe with my folks. And then most recently, last summer, I took my family to Paris to attend a scientific conference. And I got to see Murray Curry's granddaughter, who's actually a scientist, um, speaking about her grandparents. And what I found most fascinating is that not only did Murray Curry win two Nobel Prizes, one in physics and one in chemistry, is that the discoveries about radioactivity that led to those Nobel Prizes happened when she had two small children. So that was something that I had never known before. And I, you know, being a mother myself of two small children, that's no small feat. So that was really exciting to me. She also was the first female faculty member at two universities. One is the University of Paris. And some of her early work when she went to go present it, she was not allowed to present it because she was a female scientist. And so her husband had to step in and present her work. So kind of on that theme of being the first female faculty, when I was a geology major at Whitman College back in the 1990s, there was no female faculty members in the geology department. And when I started as a graduate student at the University of Michigan, I was pleased that I had a female advisor who was a wonderful advisor, but she was one of four faculty members that were female. And she was the first female professor in the geology department at the University of Michigan. And the distinctive thing during that era, and this was you know, only 1998, so not that long ago, is that the four female faculty members, none of them had children. So as a graduate student, I got the message that you either could choose to be a mother or choose to be a scientist. And my, my hope going into the future um, is that younger generation will be able to look at female scientists and see that it don't necessarily have to make that choice. If you want to have a children, you can both be a top researcher as well as a mother. Of course, it takes a village, including my husband that's here, and my parents that are visiting, helping to take care of our children. In addition, I hope going forward in the future that the vision of scientists that young children and students have is not just of Caucasian women, but of minorities, um, for example, African-American women, especially in the earth sciences, are very underrepresented. So are LGBTQ. So I hope that, again, going into the future, we see a lot more diversity in the sciences. So there's another woman that I wanted to highlight. So when Dr. Valerie Truitt set up this series, which, by the way, was part of a National Science Foundation career award that Valerie got, which is very prestigious, she came up with the idea with Shippard to have this Women in Science Cafe um, to highlight more some of our work on campus. And Shippard asked me to think of a famous female hydrologist in history. And to be honest, I couldn't think of one. And when I looked up the women on Wikipedia, I had never heard of them. So I decided instead that I would highlight somebody that inspires me today. So this is a woman, Professor Barbara Sherwood Lawler who's a professor, um, a geochemist at the University of Toronto. 
And she's the most decorated person in my field. She's pretty much won every deserving award in the field. And the, another reason I wanted to highlight her work, um, besides the fact that she's a mother, and she's the one who told me, go ahead, take your children to Paris. They're going to have a great time. They're going to benefit from traveling the world with you. Well, what Barbara does, which is so exciting, is that she's truly an explorer in today's world. So the world that she's exploring is the deep subsurface. So she goes down kilometers in old gold mines, and she finds water that is flowing out of fractures that's on the scale of billions of years old. So water that's been trapped for billions of years. And not only is this water flowing, it's bubbling with gases. And some of these gases are generated by ancient microbes and microbes that are living today. So I find her work really inspiring. And to give you a flavor of where some of these billion-year-old waters and microbes are found, her work is in what we call the continental crust. So it's the old rocks that make up our land surface. Everything in blue and green are these old Precambrian and Archean, so think billion-year-old rocks that we still find flowing water today, which could be some water resources. My work actually is in what we call the sedimentary pile, or the sedimentary units that are on top of these really old rocks. And those sedimentary aquifers also contain very old water, which I'll show you today. So most of the water that my research group dates is on the order of thousands to millions of years old. So that brings us to the topic of today's lecture, which is the race for groundwater, and it really is a race, and that groundwater is a shrinking resource. And I would argue in the state of Arizona, especially in Tucson, we're much more aware of the limitations of water in the desert. There's a fantastic article that came out in the New York Times this summer, I think in July. And if you haven't read it, I really recommend it. It's called The Water Wars of Arizona. And it really touches us in southern Arizona. So what the article features is the Sulphur Springs Valley, which is just two valleys over from Tucson to the east as you go towards El Paso. And the reason why this area was highlighted is right now there is an actual race for groundwater. So over about the last 15 years, there's been a lot of large agricultural industry that's come into this valley. And one of these um, farm fields, just to illustrate that. And the article interestingly follows this family that moved from Pennsylvania to Arizona um, several years ago. And their 300 foot water well went dry. Because of all of the groundwater pumping that is happening in this area because of these large um, commercial agricultural industries that have come in. So there's been farming in this part of Arizona for a long time, and they've been slowly pumping out groundwater. But these really big farms that have come in, they've been pumping much larger quantities of groundwater. So much bigger straws sucking groundwater out of the ground, causing the regional water table to lower. And some of those industries, just to paint the picture, are things like the nut industry. So all of the orchards, you know, the nut farming that's come to Arizona, which interesting, a lot of those nuts go to China, which I learned today. Um, the big greenhouses that have come in over the last 10 years. Turns out this part of Arizona supply is the biggest supplier of tomatoes in the United States. And these issues in the Sulphur Springs Valley are not unique. So there are other rural um, valleys in Arizona that are facing the same thing, where you have these big agro-industries coming in, um, pumping out groundwater. So that leads to several questions. So for example, these, these people that their drinking water wells are going dry, there's hundreds of them in this area that are all facing the same issue. And it leads to questions like, how deep can we drill for fresh water? If my water well goes dry, can I drill a deeper well? If I drill a deeper well, what is the quality of the groundwater at depth? In general, I'll show you that the quality typically declines with depth in groundwater. So at some point, there's a limit. If I pump out groundwater, how quickly will it be replenished? 
And finally, who else is competing for that water? So these are some of the questions that um, my research group addresses, and several of my students and postdocs are in the audience. It's also the questions that I'm going to focus on today. So before I get to that, I just want to back up for a second and make sure that everybody is on the same page about what groundwater is. So this is a picture that um, came from a publication a couple years ago that looks pretty similar to what groundwater would look like um, around Tucson and also the Sulphur Springs Valley. So think of groundwater as water beneath the earth that is filling pore spaces. So think of like a sponge. So groundwater is not some flowing lake. It's not some river underground. It's water within pore spaces of rocks. And that everything below this blue line is the groundwater, and that blue line represents the water table. In general, domestic water wells, so for example, if we lived in rural Arizona, we would have our own drinking water well. They're typically pretty shallow, and that's because you pay per depth of the well. So you go as deep as you can, and you find water, and you stop. Whereas these big agro industries, they've got a lot deeper pockets, and so they can afford to de drill a lot deeper wells. And so that might be represented by this deep well. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that when you pump groundwater out of the ground, you often form what's called a cone of depression. And that means that the, the sediment around that well dries out. And that's what happened to these homeowners in the Sulphur Springs Valley where all of a sudden they found that their domestic well was now, the water table was below their well and they were sucking in sand instead of water. So why is groundwater so important? It's critical in the United States because it's the primary drinking water supply source for about half the people that live in the United States. And of all the water used for irrigation, which is the biggest user of water in the United States, it's about 43%. So farms use about 43% of groundwater for irrigation. And worldwide, over 2 billion people rely on groundwater as their primary water supply source. So this is not unique to Arizona. It's a worldwide problem. So this next figure tries to, to put it in terms of some quantities. So most of the fresh water on Earth is tied up in the glaciers. So if we forget about the glaciers, we forget about the ocean, the vast majority of water on Earth is as groundwater and a little bit of surface water. Of all of that groundwater, over 97% of it is what we call fossil. So that means that groundwater was recharged over about 100 years ago, mostly on the time scale of thousands to tens of thousands of years old. So that means that if we extract that groundwater through pumping for irrigation or drinking water supply, we're mining that groundwater. So back to the Sulphur Springs Valley, these fossil groundwaters are found in this area. And I'm going to show you an example in a second. And this fossil groundwater is not only found in the Sulphur Springs Valley, it's also found throughout Arizona. And that's in part, I'll just say now, because our climate about 15,000 years ago was a lot wetter and colder than it is today. We were at the end of the last ice age. And so a lot of our groundwater was recharged under this past climate, and we've essentially been drying out ever since. When I first came to Arizona in 2006, um, I did a study, actually, in the Sulphur Springs Valley. Um, I had two students. We went out there, and we sampled homeowners' wells all throughout the area. And this is a picture that is showing you the Sulphur Springs Valley and down near Wilcox. And what I wanted to show you is that each of the black arrows represents groundwater flow. So in general, groundwater is recharged in the mountain blocks at the mountain front and floors towards the center of the basin. The Sulphur Springs Valley is an interesting place because it's what we call a closed basin, so there's no outlet except for evaporation and transpiration by plants. And so we've got the Wilcox Playa in the center. What these black circles represent are huge cones of depression that have formed because of overpumping of the groundwater. 
And so the one that is in the New York Times article is up here to the north. If we look at a cross-section, meaning we look at a two-dimensional slice of the Earth across this basin, most of the groundwater in the basin, it's going to be in what we call alluvial aquifers. So this is essentially a giant sandbox that came from erosion of the mountains. And groundwater is recharged primarily in the mountains because that's where we've got high elevation, that's where we have more precipitation, we've got the topographic drive for groundwater. So water is recharged in the mountains or at the mountain front and flows towards the center of the basin. But when we did this study many years ago now, we went around dating the groundwater from homeowners' wells. And we do that using carbon-14, which is radioactive, and it's the same thing as dating old bones. We date the carbon that's in the water. And we also use something called tritium, so when we exploded all those nuclear weapons in the 1950s and 60s, we put, we put tritium up in the atmosphere, and it rained out and recharged the groundwater. So it's not harmful to human health, but if we find tritium in groundwater, we know that groundwater was recharged since the 1950s. So using both of those techniques throughout the Wilcox Basin and the Sulphur Springs Valley, we found that all of the groundwater was older than 70 years old, so that means it's older than our, our lifetimes, plus 30 years, hopefully. And that most of the groundwater is on the order of thousands to tens of thousands of years old. So this is that fossil groundwater. And I've since done, done work in the Tucson Basin, the Sienica Creek Watershed, the San Pedro Basin, and these fossil groundwater is pervasive throughout southern Arizona. So that means if we extract it, it's not coming back anytime soon. So to put this in perspective, and I'm going to talk in a second about climate change, there was an interesting paper and figure from one of the faculty in my department, Tom Meixner, that again shows one of these kind of two-dimensional pictures of what an alluvial basin and the groundwater looks like. The blue is the water table. In general, as I said, in all of these mountain system, basins, we've got recharge in the mountain ranges. We get very little recharge across the basin floor. Any rain that falls on the basin floor is used by plants and goes right back to the atmosphere. We might get a little bit of recharge along the washes and just a little bit from irrigation. If we look at what the picture is going to look like in the future, and by the way, we've already seen a drying of southern Arizona. Over the last 20 years, we've seen that we've had 10 of the hottest years on record. Um, we've been in a long drought period. Our precipitation has been going down. And importantly, the amount of precipitation in the mountains, especially as snowfall, has been going down. So what that means going into the future is that we're going to be having less recharge from the mountains, less recharge across the valleys, possibly more recharge along our washes because of during the monsoon storms, we get focused recharge. And if there's more irrigation, you're basically just recycling the water and having recharge. So I call all of these things that we've been talking about, so climate change as well as extraction of groundwater, mostly for agriculture, some for human supply, as top-down pressures on water resources. What this graph is showing you is that this is not unique to Arizona. This is happening worldwide. We now have satellite capability to be able to tell how groundwater resources have been shrinking around the globe. And that's essentially what this graph is showing you. It's showing you the total amount of groundwater storage over the last about 10 years. And they're all the trends for most of these aquifers around the world are going down. So we're rapidly depleting these water resources because of over extraction of groundwater, also climate change and drought, so that means there's less water coming in as recharge. And then also make sure to mention that we're also contaminating that groundwater. So with agriculture, for example, we're using excess fertilizers, which contain nitrate. So nitrate contamination of groundwater is the number one water quality problem around the world. So those are all of the top-down pressures on water. So this brings me to a recent study um, that I just published with a colleague from the University of Saskatchewan. 
where we looked at what the depth of freshwater resources was across the United States. And the purpose of the study was to get at that question of, if my water well dries out, how deep can I drill? And so that's dependent on freshwater resources. How deep do they go? And so what this map is showing you is that these are regional aquifer systems around the United States. And anything in blue means that you've got groundwater up to over 1,000 feet deep in these aquifers. So we're located right here in Tucson, and we're part of what's called the Basin and Range Province. So those cross sections I showed you pretty much looks like that all the way up to um, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada. So basins and mountain ranges. So we're lucky in the southwest, which I'll show you in a second, because we have deep, fresh water. If you go to a place like Michigan, for example, where I went to graduate school, there you've got saline groundwater, so very salty groundwater right near the surface. And your zone of fresh water is really shallow. The next thing we looked at is what is called brackish water. So in general, beneath fresh water is a zone of slightly salty water. So this is water that has a salinity of up to about 10,000 milligrams per liter, total dissolved solids. So brackish water is like what you would find in an estuary between fresh water mixing with seawater. So brackish water, it's not something that we would drink just fill up a cup of brackish water, be too saline. But there's new technology, such as reverse osmosis, to be able to clean up that water to make it fresh. So as we're depleting this freshwater resources, we're having to use what we call marginal waters. So in our lifetime, we might be seeing um, desalinization of brackish waters, for example. They can also be used in some agricultural industries. They could be used in oil and gas for hydraulic fracturing. So when we look at brackish water resources, again, they're deep in places like Arizona. They're shallow in places like Michigan, which I'll come back to in a second. So this idea of salinity increasing with depth, and that's important because think of it as decreasing water quality or usability of that water with depth. It's, it's more complex, essentially, than the simple picture that I've been painting. So there are places in Arizona, even the Sulphur Spring Valley, where because of the Wilcox Playa, you actually get more saline water at the surface and fresher water at depth. In addition, along places like the Gila River, we do have saltier water closer to the surface. So let's take a look at how deep we can drill for water resources. So what this figure is showing you is in purple is fresh water, and in pink is brackish water. And if we take two in members, so let's go to Michigan, for example. What's on top of here in blue is the depth of drinking water wells. So the take home message for a place like Michigan is that you don't have a very thick window of fresh water resources. That fresh water is really thin, riding on top of more saline water. So in a place like Michigan, if your water well goes dry, you can't necessarily drill much deeper because you'll hit this saltwater body. We're in a place like Arizona, in the Basin and Range province, we've got fresh water down to a kilometer. We've got brackish water down to two kilometers. Okay, so in a place like Arizona, we have the possibility of drilling deeper. Of course, it's going to be place dependent. It's more complex than that. But if you could afford it, you could potentially drill deeper. There's an interesting dynamic that's happening right now. So these brackish water resources are already being used up in ways that are somewhat out of sight, out of mind specifically by the oil and gas industry. So that's what I want to talk about now. So what's shown on these graphs is for a couple different locations. Again, these are end members. For example, the Appalachian Basin, which is always in the news because of the Marcellus Shale gas play and the hydraulic fracturing that's happening to produce the natural gas 
What this is showing you is in the blue bars is how salinity or total dissolved solids increases with depth. And what it sh and the, the top in the blue bar is the extent of freshwater aquifers or water well depths. And down at the bottom in red is where oil and gas companies are injecting hydraulic fracturing fluids in order to break up the tight shale to produce natural gas. The take home message is for that places like the Appalachian Basin, the Anadarko Basin or the Fort Worth Basin, there's not much competition, meaning where hydraulic fracturing is happening is very deep compared to where people have their drinking water wells. Okay. In contrast, and this is the important part, is that there are places like the Michigan Basin, the Wind River Basin up in Wyoming, and the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and Montana, where hydraulic fracturing and uh, natural gas production is happening very close to where there are drinking water wells. So that brings up a couple issues. One is the potential for contamination related to hydraulic fracturing, and the other is the competition for water. So the Powder River Basin is a great example what they're producing there is natural gas from coal beds. This is coal bed methane. It's generated by microbes, and it's a fresh to brackish water aquifer. In order to produce the natural gas, they have to pump out water to depressurize the coal. That water is then sometimes reinjected, often um, disposed of into local waterways. And so the oil and gas industry is extracting groundwater for gas production, which could be used for drinking water wells, agriculture, etc. So in places like the Michigan Basin, the Wind River, and the Powder River Basin, there's direct competition for those water resources um, for human consumption as well as energy development. And as one other example of that, I really liked this picture that came out um, just this year. These are all of the um, oil and gas wells in the United States from these tight shales. They're called unconventional. But what that means is that these are places that they're doing hydraulic fracturing to produce shale gas. These are all of the wells that are producing brackish water. So again, that's an example of this direct competition between the oil and gas industry and us needing it for human consumption. So kind of related to this topic, a big area of research for my research group is related to hydraulic fracturing. So if we inject fluids underground to break up these tight formations to produce the natural gas that we're all using, if there was contamination from hydraulic fracturing, specifically of these freshwater aquifers um, that are so important for, for human consumption, how could we trace that contamination? So the best example is take the homeowner's wells in Pennsylvania that have been so famous on YouTube videos or in the movie Gasland, where all of a sudden the farmer's drinking water well starts bubbling with methane. Okay? So there's always two sides of the spectrum. There's the people that say, it's because there's a shale gas well in my backyard, this just started, I know that it's because of hydraulic fracturing and shale production, gas production. On the end of the end of the spectrum, there's people that would say, well, that homeowner just wasn't paying attention. And they always had natural gas in their well, and they just didn't notice it until the shale gas well went into their backyard. So that's where my research comes into play. I, two years ago, was invited twice to Vienna to participate, actually to lead a workshop um, put on by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which I thought was interesting because I think of the IAEA from the news of people that go to places like Iran and look for nuclear weapon development. But actually the motto of the IAEA is atoms for peaceful purposes. So they have a whole arm that's focused on water resources and doing things like dating groundwater and determining the source of contamination related to things like hydraulic fracturing. So that was the focus of our workshop. And the woman that I, I mentioned in the beginning, Professor Barbara Schur Lawler, led this workshop with me. 
back to this picture, um, again, it's quite challenging to determine what the source of contamination is and if it's related to hydraulic fracturing, kind of for two parts. One is the fact that there are so many sources of methane besides leakage from hydraulic fracturing into shallow aquifers. There's methane that's being naturally generated today in aquifers. There's methane that migrated over geologic time into aquifers. There's methane that comes up abandoned oil and gas wells. So this picture should look complicated to you, and that's because it is. There's so many different sources of contamination. And so what my research group has been focused on, and we just submitted a paper yesterday, is providing a roadmap to regulators, to researchers, on how to determine what the source of contamination is. The other reason why it's so complicated is that often the regulators will do what I would say is, is too simplistic of an approach. It's not conclusive. And there's a lot of additional but more complicated tracers that we can use to figure out where the contamination is coming from. But often that's more in universities and research labs. So how do we bridge that gap? This should look complicated to you. Don't worry about the details. I just wanted to mention that one thing my group is doing is essentially providing a roadmap to people to say, how would you determine the source of contamination? What tracers would you use? And in what order would you apply them? Okay. So in summary, this is a simple picture of groundwater in the subsurface. And that in general, salinity increases with depth. And what we're all after is this fresh water limited shrinking water supply. We're starting to use some more brackish water, and at great depth is this higher salinity water that, that we wouldn't use for drinking water. There's a fierce competition right now for this shrinking resource, both from the top down, from over extraction of water, because we need it for things like agriculture and all the food supply to feed the growing population on this planet, we're also contaminating the groundwater from the top down. But from the bottom up, at the same time, we're using these brackish waters and more saline waters for things like production of our energy supply. I didn't mention it, but we are also injecting a lot of things into these aquifers. We're injecting not only hydraulic fracturing fluids, we're injecting any of the water that's produced for energy production back into what are called exempt aquifers in the United States. So to end it with a, a punchline is that it's a subsurface porosity race right now, is what people like to call it in my field. So we're not only racing for that limited water supply to use it, but once we extract it, think about those poor spaces in the sponge. That's a place to store things. And we've got a lot of stuff to store right now. We've got nuclear waste that's just being held at the surface that is not a safe long-term solution. One idea is to put the nuclear waste underground into these deep aquifers. We're talking about scrubbing CO2 from power plants to reduce carbon in the atmosphere, to reduce climate change that we desperately need to do. We're talking about putting that into those empty pore spaces. So again, right now, there's a lot of um, competition for what's happening in the subsurface. And I guess I end it with pay attention. And thank you all for coming tonight. You clearly are committed to this important topic. So I'll end it there, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.